Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the White Pute Podcast. My name is Gabrielle De La Puente. And I'm Serena Mohammed. And we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, basically, me and Serena are losing our minds uh, in, the, <laughs> in the midst of writing a book. We don't necessarily find it easy to say things at the moment because we're just so focused on writing. Um, but we feel a lovely obligation to provide more interesting content to our art interested audience so what we've done today is invite an interesting person that we know (laughs) and they're gonna (laughs) entertain everyone on our behalf Uh, we are joined today by v buckingham who is an artist slash many different things and i think that many different things end of the sentence is going to be the subject of today's podcast hello v how are you doing I, I like I like how little pressure you've introduced me with with like yes <laughs> this person is going to single handedly entertain us like our brains are <laughs> liquefied. <laughs> you made it sound like we're losing our minds and we are. We are. Yeah, we're going to chat to V today and ask some interesting questions um, about what art they make, but also what is a creative technologist and some projects that are about to be launched mm-hmm. that are exciting mm-hmm. and I, that I think a lot of our audience will love to be honest you got to humor me for this first question because i think gab alluded to that artist and many other things you are polymath right (laughs) sure sure yeah yeah go on then (laughs) (laughs) i'm saying it yes polymath um so the first question is hello imagine i'm an alien or a child please describe your practice to me in a way that i would understand and enjoy uh So I set my, I always think like what you put as your like bio is kind of interesting for this. So my bio on Mastodon is I make things that make other things. Uh, So I guess that's, that seems about right. Like, so I guess the most, the the two main like strands are either making a computer program that then makes the art, if that makes sense, or making a tool that other people can then use to make the art. So it's always like a little bit one step removed what did you um study at university to like lead you into making things in the first place because i've got like a a question i don't quite know how to word which is how do you do all of the things that you do like (laughs) practically speaking how do you know so many things (laughs) uh so the degree was cognitive science which is like kind of a weird one in itself uh so like at the university i went to it was basically like a joint degree between psychology like computer science you could also do linguistics and philosophy in there I did a bit of linguistics and then was really bad at it so I dropped it um so I guess I came out like having studied psychology and having thought about a bunch of stuff from that and having done a load of like AI related work and just general kind of computer science stuff so it was a real kind of grab bag of stuff but I guess it came out of it with with that you know some ability to program and some kind of familiarity and friends who were kind of in that scene and then also I guess just a lot of thinking about human behavior and how to like make systems and how to like think about it from that side of it um but I think I actually got better like in my practice after I'd left and after I was like working in games and making my own projects there and just kind of putting stuff together there um a thing I really like about making games especially in kind of small teams is it's just like there's just too many different things you need to be able to do (laughs) like it's like to make a game it's like oh yeah yeah you need to do the sounds and you need to do the visuals and you need to do the programming and you need to test it with people and you need to think about how you're going to market it and you need to think about yeah just like all of these things all of and every game is different so it throws up like random problems so I think it's like kind of you do that for a while and then you just suddenly are, you start developing that like, oh, yeah, 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 I can do that. Like, I've not done it before, but probably I can do that well enough, well enough to get this thing done. Uh, then 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 I guess like a load of the projects still kind of come from that same mindset. It's just it's like, oh, yeah, the thing the thing you're making doesn't have a win condition. <laughs> mm, and what games have you worked on? <laughs> uh, so I've worked on um one that you've definitely heard of Metassione which I worked on for a few years um 
which I, I think you reviewed, right? I reviewed in 2020. Yeah. 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 I left that project a few years before it was out. So a load of the stuff with the story and stuff, I can't really take any credit for, but there were good colors and I can take responsibility for the way those colors change. So <laughs> 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 definitely claiming that. Uh, so yeah, I worked on that. I worked on... I worked on a game for a promotional game for Azalea Banks, where she is a mermaid. What? Swimming underwater. That was the first studio I was at. Wow. Uh, oh my wow. god! <laughs> like, didn't didn't get to meet her, but like, we sent it over to her for like feedback and approval. And the one comment we got was, "Can you make my butt bigger?" Amazing. Yes. <laughs> this is that's. You know, sometimes what you want from an anecdote, like, you, you know what you want from, like, a, someone else's anecdote, and that was just, like, exactly 100% what I was after. Yeah. <laughs> Those are all someone else's, like, ideas that you are working to fulfil. When when did you start to, like, yeah, veer off and make art or games or mm. whatever we're going to call them that were totally coming from you and made by you and fulfilled by you? Uh, yeah, so it was kind of always kind of alongside. I was always making stuff. And I guess there's like a bit of a divergence where it started off as I was making games alongside. And then and then it was other things that weren't necessarily games or kind of drifted further away from that. But maybe that's not even true, actually. Maybe I was still always working on stuff that was kind of weird alongside. I just didn't like think of it as a practice, more just a like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if I made this thing, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Um, but what was the first thing that you made that you were like, that that felt like, oh my God, okay, I feel like I am an artist. Like, it, this, this is now undeniable. I actually can't hide it anymore. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe other people relate to this actually. Like, it definitely for me, it was like, I had been paid a reasonable amount of money to give an artist talk and I still felt insecure about calling myself an artist <laughs> like so I think like the point at which I was definitely an artist was like earlier than the point at which I was just like yeah no I'm an artist like this is this is an identity I feel comfortable kind of claiming and having if that makes sense but where why was there any discomfort yeah then? I think it's just the yeah I don't know like this it's the it's the here is this community of people that I don't feel part of, I guess. I was part of like, yeah, game game developers who, like there are artists, but those are like, oh, the people who do like 2D, 3D artists, that's what that word means in that community. And then I was involved in a load of stuff with like Twitter bot, Twitter bots and making Twitter bots and making tools for other people to make Twitter bots. Um, and with a load of people there who are like very clearly digital artists and like reasonably accomplished ones. But at the same time, like people there were bot makers. <laughs> rather than artists I guess it was kind of looking at this stuff and like the stuff I was making and kind of going oh actually no like I guess this is art I guess this is art that could be legible in like this kind of artistic community I guess I'm gonna like actually call myself that and try to exist within this new community I think what you're picking up on is like dependent on the context the identity of an artist means different things and when you're speaking to me and you're telling me all of these like cool things that you do that seem like you know why would a human spend their time doing these things <laughs> it's just for fun and because it does something that makes you go oh that was cool or oh my god how did you do that or that looks good I think well obviously that person is an artist but it's like that moment in house that I always think about where if a patient presents with issues and a cardiologist is the first person to see them, the cardiologist is going to think it's something to do with the heart. Mm. Um, and if it's a neurologist, they're going to think it's something to do with the nervous system. Like, I think seeing this through an art critic lens, um, I have to be aware that I've never worked in the game industry. And an artist is listed in the credits of a game. They're normally the person who did, like, just the technical, like production of the artwork in the thing it's not even necessarily that they came up with the concept design because that might be another job on top of that and they're just following someone else's instructions and then it makes me think like is an artist someone who comes up with everything from beginning to end on their own or can you be like an artist to hire which also exists but like <laughs> I don't think the art world talks about that a lot and actually Something that me and Zarina have been thinking about recently is like 
how do you make it work as an artist and do people for example art students are they told about all of the different avenues that they might be able to follow in order to one make work but also make money at the same time because taking that game design route as an artist could actually be quite healthy to an extent well, lucrative potentially yeah <laughs> oh i keep thinking about um talking to someone who worked for ian cheng do you know ian cheng's work is yeah. like weird but yeah basically he was describing like the setup of that and i was like oh this is an indie game studio it's like five of you you're working with unity like it sounds like the kind of production pipeline and process is exactly that of like a you know reasonably small scale indie game studio but like the thing you're producing is artwork and the studio is called Ian Cheng. <laughs> exactly. There's almost like a sanctity or a weird stricture of art production where like if someone else is telling you what you should make, then it doesn't really count as mm. art because um, or or even if there's a fee at the end of it and they're telling you to make something very specific, like you know the aura is kind of lost because it becomes like like capitalist production less so like someone who's had an idea of their own accord and that's just so weird but also it's yeah like, i sort of get it's it it's like the kind of weird icky feeling around like capitalist production but i think also like tied to it is the idea of like the art world loves a singular genius like the art world loves a, a prodigy a virtuoso like someone who is so gifted and talented that money just simply they exist in a currencyless state where like they are able to transcend the dirty grubby realities of like actual banal existence and they just kind of sit there churning out these deliciously abstract conceptual ideas and like i think what you're identifying with that resistance of like because as i say i have effectively stalked you like really gone through your website and like even the stuff that you were making kind of on the side like punch the custard and mm. that game where um it's like you're a frog on a trampoline and you're bouncing up and down <laughs> sure yeah and like the, the <laughs> like the the graphics are bouncing up and down as well like i think there's something about like john raithman would pay really good money to like come up with an idea like that like the trampoline like just that as like a a way of experiencing a, a moving image work um that and like hell is other people like the idea that you would fight the shadow of the last player yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so hell is other people is that game that i made just when i was coming out of university so that was like the first thing i made tell um, tell the audience about it because oh, they're yeah, not yeah, gonna yeah. know what punch the custard is they're not gonna know what hell <laughs> yes, is other no, people is <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so hell is other people <laughs> is um it's like one of those kind of basic like 2d you're a little spaceship and you're firing weapons and you can pick up a thing and then you fire a different weapon except all of the enemies you're fighting are people who um have previously played the game but just like flipped so they're shooting in the other direction so you start out and they all have the beginning weapon and they're kind of shooting and they're dodging so you're like dodging as well but this means you're like shooting slightly offset to shoot where they would dodge to because that's just the kind of pattern mm -hmm. and then you start going and you're like oh no i can hide at the side and then they pick up the thing that fires sideways and you're like ah oh, damn now i have to dodge this um so yeah like incre increasing numbers of them increasing kind of difficulties there but it's this still this kind of yeah i guess i've not thought about it like it's also this kind of video game that's made by the people who are playing it so it is kind of that kind of creative tool it at the same tool. time yeah <laughs> yeah i see that and then what's punch the custard uh so punch the custard is i was kind of i guess like, kind of involved in um this kind of community who was making uh i, I don't know what the right word is like I think of it as like running around games, like <laughs> games that are like folk games or that you play. There used to be this like festival at the South Bank Centre, um, hide and seek, um, sandpit, like weekenders, and they did one kind of every month over the summer. Um, so yeah, loads of people were making stuff there, and some of it had a little bit of electronics in, some of it had different stuff. It was a really kind of cool community and really kind of cool scene that existed there. So um, yeah, I was like, oh, I want to take part in this, and I emailed my now friend holly with like oh hey i've got these like two ideas it was one of them was like some terrible thing about running around quoting shakespeare uh and then the other one was like what if you have this game where you're punching a bowl of custard like corn flour and water um 
competitively against someone else and you've got to punch it as fast as you can and also the computer knows how many times you've punched it so it like beeps and like in increments a little number uh and she's like no yeah definitely that one that one's definitely good <laughs> <laughs> what was people's reaction to it uh pretty great yeah like i i ended up running it like at a ton of places um i ended up, up like yeah it, like actually toured it went to like uh, la margate singapore <laughs> I feel I have to list Margate what because it was <laughs> LA, yeah. Singapore, Margate. <laughs> no, I have to list Margate because I went to Singapore because they showed it at Margate and uh Kate Neal, who was running it down at Margate, then got in touch and was like, Oh yeah, yeah, we're doing this thing out at like the art science center out in Singapore. Uh do you wanna do you wanna come out to Singapore for a week? Like run this for half the time and then just like see Singapore for the rest of the time? And I'm like, yes, yes, I could definitely do that. Okay, right. So this is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> of all the things that we could do as humans in the world, like, why was that so successful? Like, I don't mean that in a way I don't believe it could be, but like, <laughs> anthropologically, as someone who has studied human psychology, what do you think that says about us and you as well? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, fundamentally, it's just nice to do a strange thing it's nice to like feel a weird substance like it's like it's entirely piggybacking off like ah, oh, there's this fun substance that's fun to play with and then you're doing something kind of silly and the because like it goes for a minute and a minute is like a really long time to be doing this kind of like do something as fast as you can kind of activity so you start out and you're like oh yeah, yeah i can do this and then you get halfway through and you're like oh god can i do this ah oh. And I'm going against someone else. So I'm like competing really hard. Yeah. So you're like suddenly in this like, you know, um, yeah, real like competitive, frantic space, touching something strange. You're just, people like to be in a new weird situation, you know? Yeah. Well, that's what makes it art. Like people, every time someone goes into a gallery, they love to be in a weird situation. I think the weirder <laughs> the art, the better. In terms of in setting like weird little moments into our daily life mm. you were mentioning before about twitter bots mm. um, for anyone who maybe doesn't know what they are because you just explain uh sure yeah i mean they're just i guess twitter accounts that you can follow interact with like a normal twitter account except instead of there being like a person who posts the tweets it's a machine it's a computer program running on some computer somewhere that posts the tweets mm -hmm. um usually on like a schedule or like responding to stuff so um the stuff that i'm like i guess most interested in there is like stuff that's like relatively simple um but becomes powerful because it's in this space that you wouldn't i was gonna say you wouldn't expect but i've been like <laughs> deep within the twitter bot world for years so now i totally expect them to be there but it like is existing on a, the same level as people mm. exist in this space but it's like weird art that does operate by these different rules and you know also like produces things that are like surprising or delightful or are interesting to see all the different variations of like over time like yeah. an art an artwork that you don't like go into and you're like cool I'm like immersed in this and I'm giving it my full attention instead it's like oh I'm like glancing at this as I'm scrolling through and doing other things that, yeah. that's that's super fascinating to me it totally like just inserts itself into normality in a way that I, I've always really liked and um, I know Zarina's probably dying to speak because Zarina is the first person I ever knew who made a bot but V can you just like tell us some of your top highlights out of the bots that you have made oh um <clears throat> i guess the first one i'd say is soft landscapes which makes these like you know like when you see like a mountain right like mountain range and like there's like fog or clouds so like the ones at the back are kind of hazier and maybe the colors are beautiful like this kind of genre of picture um basically it generates those um and like it's like super simple kind of forms but like it can get some wild colors in there so that that's pretty good one i'd also just shout out is like one of the first ones i made which is basically each of the tweets is like a different step of an instruction like i remember being like round at like my grand's house and like when you arrive there the conversation as somebody who doesn't drive the conversation always starts with like ah oh, how did you get here and like this like long discussion of like the route that you took and whether it was optimal or whether it was a better route 
and you ask people like oh yeah you like mention you're going somewhere and then they're like oh yeah, yeah, yeah you should go this way and take this route and stuff like that and for me it's kind of like it's fine i just i just i'm just going to look at google maps i'm not even really listening to the thing you're saying but it's impossible to shut you up you need to you need to get this out so it's like okay yeah, yeah, yeah this is fine but it just like generates that as like a series of tweets I, I made this platform that you can make Twitter bots with called Cheat Bots Done Quick. And then recently I made one that just tweets out lines from the lyrics of dry cleaning, you know, the band. <laughs> um, on the basis that like, actually, I think the thing that Cheat Bots is mainly used for is like this kind of like tweeting out lyrics or like quotes from characters that people love. Uh, and I was like, oh, I want to do this. And then doing it was actually really nice just to be like, here's a band I really love who has lyrics that I really like. And just like looking through their entire set of lyrics to like chop them up into tweet sized quotes and like think about what's good to do there was like this really nice, like engaging with their work. I love that. That's, they're my favorite ones as well. I love ones that are more like image based, like Many Gradients, Soft Landscapes, Unicode Garden as well. Mm. Um, and like people, yeah, when it, when, loads of little emojis pop out the ones that look like deserts things like that the desert one's my favorite it's so good because sometimes you get a little snake, <laughs> a little snake. <laughs> but but i think like yeah maybe even more than that the ones that sort of start to like eat themselves a bit fascinate me because as you say they start to come out with things that you just weren't expecting them to which um is great which is why zarina's one is also so funny to me um for context listeners and V um my bot I made her her I've personified her she's her own separate like sentient entity in my mind because she's been running for like I think eight seven eight years um but she is a non sequitur twitter bot I think is the thing I like I fully pinched the code from someone I didn't write it all myself um but um she just takes the content of my tweets and my retweets and she kind of like turns them into like a jumbly soup um like she she does like the snipping herself like the the back end on like heroku or wherever it takes place like the python the python code does that (laughs) yeah another snake (laughs) that one i hand it over to the snake (laughs) and um like it kind of yeah garbles it up and then spits out Kind of this weird Dada surrealist poetry from like my own words, but like mm. I, I think it, 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 the fascination I had with it at the time, um, because I haven't heard from her in a while. I don't know why, but Elon's new algorithm just means that I just don't see her um, on timeline. But like at the time when I made her, the fascination that I had was very much what you described that like small punctuation, like the delight, right? Of like mm-hmm. the staccato delight of like her popping up on my timeline when I wasn't expecting her. Like, like your alter think, ego, yeah. Yeah, but it was, uh, it's yeah, I think you used the word delightful, like something that, that would be like, um, yeah, that feels like the right word for the way that those bots function because, um, or like the, yeah, there is like a, a little pleasure in it. Like, um, it's just nice, it, it, mm-hmm. it just is mm-hmm. nice. Like it's, it's not like nice on like a grand spectacular scale. It's like a very, um, uh, like a really small human mm. um, niceness, which I, I really like. I, re- I I think like the scale of that, like small, it's, it's the small things that like make up the entire world, right? Like it's like the world doesn't take place at like um, the scale of like the enormous or like the geopolitical, it's like the, the small crunchy things. Um, I do have a question about maybe particularly what it is about bot. Like, why do you want to see more bots in the world? Because cheat bots done quick is about facilitating other people's access to this as like a technological format or like a like other, affecting other people's ability to actually go out and make this stuff. Um, why do you want to see more bots in the world? I've like I've like thought about this like weirdly. I only thought about it obviously when and after I made it and it was up and like. You know, like when I was making it, it was just like, of course, this is like a good thing to do. Um, but also, then afterwards, which is also why you're an artist, because artists <laughs> exactly just do things yeah. and then like <laughs> figure it out later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, fundamentally, it's like, of course, I want to see more of this, just because people enjoy making things. People enjoy like creating something and getting that like 
you know, the creativity of like, oh, I wanted something to, I don't know, post post some random thing regularly, like like I wanted that to happen and now I have and like it's brought kind of delight and it gives people that kind of creative canvas that like they wouldn't otherwise have because it's like making a Twitter bot is I mean this is this is what I had at the beginning was just like making a Twitter bot is like fundamentally like an annoying process. Like it runs on a server. Okay, cool. Like so now I have to have a server and I have to like have something running on a server reliably. Like that's just that's annoying for me to solve let alone someone who does not have a kind of technical background and you have to do all of this just to make something that's like the Arthur Morgan bot like all of that work just to tweet like red dead quotes <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's totally like it's just it's just not worth doing there were people in the kind of bot making community who were just kind of like yeah you, you've just kind of got, got to do this and like because it was only those people in the community people who could do all of that and who felt that was like easy or like manageable they were like oh it's fine and then I looked at it and I was like this is this is annoying and it could be better and I also like the kind of um I guess like making generative work is a kind of interesting thing in itself for me like making a generative work is interesting because you're not making a thing like the output is not the thing you're making you're making like the probability of various things being in that output like the thing you thing you said, Serena, about the um, deserts and how sometimes there's a snake. Like the decision to have a snake there, like very rarely is like an interesting creative decision to me. But it's like an interesting thing because it's like if you look at any one of those outputs, that decision doesn't come through. You only see the decision in like repeatedly engaging with it and then noticing, oh, there's a snake and that's rare. Like, so like crafting that is a kind of interesting thing to me. And like, there's not many ways that people get to play with that kind of thing, except Twitter bots do give that kind of, kind of joy. So yeah. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. like, I, I don't want to be this person because I went to like a talk by Ed Atkins at the Contemporary Art Society years and years ago, where he was like, we should not be speaking about technology as if it's some kind of magic. Like we shouldn't be speaking about the internet. Like it's, you know, or the cloud as if there are these like impossible magical things that we don't have any control over because who knows what they are and like I feel like I have been that person for so long but when I see Twitter bots I think oh it's like a it's like a parlor trick it's like a little magic trick and how amazing that like V the wizard is the person who's like teaching everyone how to do the magic behind the scenes by providing a tool in order to be able to do it I feel like the same confusing mystique when you talk about generative art because it does have that like wonder attached to it like oh my god because you have set something up you don't know what art is going to come out of it but that's almost like not the point it's the setting it up and making those creative decisions that is where you're happy to leave it at um what have you made in terms of generative art that you would be interested in telling the audience about because I can mm. see if for the people who watch the video version that you've got something behind you that is like <laughs> <laughs> a giveaway <laughs> and actually, uh, I want to know how to say this out loud so V's website if anyone wants to go and have a look is v21.io and on the side there is a list of artworks um and two of them are not language in any <laughs> recognizable sense <laughs> but they're called Either something way. else <laughs> you know with emojis you can just say the emoji and you can like, uh -huh, yeah like... so i'm this used to like block, translating block, block, block. pictographs into into words now because of the emoji summaries but with this i don't even know like it's like shaded like shaded square shaded i think square. <laughs> <laughs> right, so gab when you when you edit this can you just like replace the thing i'm about to say with like just like a bunch of static yes. so uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i'd say it as perfect okay like the stuff that they were making was like so garbled that it didn't didn't feel right to give them a name that would otherwise work i don't know when you click on the page that is like what happens a pattern forms and then the pattern kind of i guess kind of continues eating itself and continues changing 
I don't know. I just, yeah, like I'm like I'm like trying to describe it on one level, and I'm like, there's two two levels I can describe it on. One is the kind of just like aesthetic of like it eats itself, and there's kind of patterns that feed back on each each other and kind of develop, and you can kind of see like a crease that then kind of extends itself out or becomes a line, and there's kind of these patterns that are forming by themselves. Um, and then I guess the like more technical level is that as it as it runs each of the like pixels on the screen is like fed into an input. And so each of the pixels depends on like all of the pixels around it, um, which it like adds up, it basically adds up the values in all of those pixels um, with random kind of weighting. And then that produces a pattern. So it starts with here is like a particular pattern. And then we add this, just keep on layering on this kind of like adding stuff up. And the technical term for that is convolution i was about to say that sounds like really friendly maths like <laughs> <laughs> really interpersonal maths like the pixels and mates and there yeah just... you might you might also hear a bunch of this from like ai stuff because a bunch of the ai algorithms are about like creating these like set of weightings that the convolution works on like that's how a lot of this kind of ai stuff works is like training to find that but instead of doing it like with AI and training very cleverly to find these weights instead it's just like ah what if we have some random weights so there's a like a little bit of like aesthetic similarity there between like this and I guess the kind of like um those kind of early deep dream things where it like kept making dogs and it kept like just adding crinkly detail into stuff um it's actually the same algorithm that like photoshop uses when you say oh yeah yeah do a blur mm. or sharpen it's that same kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, take take the edges and like highlight those. So it's like, oh, what well, if you just like keep taking the edges and highlighting them and then doing that repeatedly until it just becomes this like grainy, <laughs> grainy mess. And you've you've done it with color as well in the mm. RGB piece, which is. Sort yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. So then I kind of came back to it and I was like, oh, what if I did this with color and um then i kind of worked on it a bit more and ended up like instead of sampling necessarily the next pixel it can like sample pixels like further away because all of these like convolution ones always have this kind of you don't have like kind of large forms you only have this kind of like texture that builds up or occasionally you have large forms but it's like very focused on this kind of texture so i was like what if you could you have it where it's like a larger wash of color um and so I think the RGB one actually does this, all of this pixel stuff, and it does it for like red, green, and blue separately. Um, and then con constantly seeding it with like a dot of red, dot of blue, mm -hmm. dot of green. It's, I just want to underline that all of these exist on web pages, like inter and interactively so as well. Like you can click and start to mess with like the pattern of it as it happens. I'm absolutely burning to ask you because I think with and with um, the other the other second one with the with the boxes in there wiggly on two levels that one how do you say mm -hmm. that one <laughs> I think that's also... That also okay so with and second different kind of static and RGB and calming sphere I think and maybe epicycles as well I was um. I was like having having a plink plonk like a tip tap type around last night, and um, I was sending them to someone, and we were like sending each other like little screenshots of like the like the things that were popping up, like like the little pages, and like just swapping back and forth these like d like delicious, delightful images. And I I, I think I want to know now if um, you think of yourself as a painter of sorts like do you do you feel because i if this, there's so much about like the way these web pages function that feels painterly or like um painterly in the way that they generate images like painterly in like a time-based way or like a digital way like but like but fundamentally like painting mm. do you want think... v to think of themselves as a painter <laughs> no no i'm just I, I i i think it's something that i would say about you but I'm a critic. Of course I'd say that. 
Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a critic that loves paintings. Of course, I'd say that. Like, it's that thing, um, right? Like, it, yeah, you just submit like RGB to the John Moore's painting prize this year. Oh my god, I do beg it! You. Oh my god, it'd be a shoe in. We'd both be there. Like, you should definitely. I want this one to win. <laughs> because, but like, regardless of whether I want to call you a painter, would you like? has that term ever like popped up in your mind like is is it about like the pleasure of producing images or is it more of like a technical question i think that's the question i'm i think i mean i don't think i'd call myself a painter from that but i definitely take the compliment (laughs) (laughs) um but i think that i think there is something to it and just in terms of that like mm, like just you know like a lot of it is just this kind of delight in the texture of it or like the texture of the colors and how that stuff is interacting and I guess it's like also just trying to I guess like trying to understand that like trying to understand it by making stuff that creates it trying to understand like that kind of texture and form and like being interested in exploring that like I guess it's kind of interesting like building these things because it's like I'm making them because I don't know how they're going to work. And then I make them and then I'm like exploring in them. And like, you know, I feel like I'm discovering stuff as much as I'm like creating it or like, also like all of these are like kind of techniques that already existed before. Like, I'm not like creating the idea of convolution or anything. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, this is like an existing thing. So it's more like, I want to make it and see how it feels and then and then you're kind of exploring it and then like then there's usually a kind of stage a bit later than that where it's kind of like how do I like package this up so that I can give some of that like sense of exploration to other people and I've like kind of made the version where it doesn't crash all the time and where it actually does the interesting thing <laughs> more often than not so like it exposes the the interesting part so yeah. yeah I don't know on on your website under the RGB like in the RGB explanation it says what forms do these processes create what does it look like to wander randomly through this state space and I feel like wandering randomly looks like Zarina sending like snapshots of what she found and what she got to see like they're the things that she discovered in the exploration and it's really Mm. nice your website is also a good example of how art can exist online um so maybe sometimes better than it can exist in a gallery because it's on a web page and you can access it any time of night. Like, <laughs> like, do you worry about how this might translate into exhibition spaces? I don't know. I mean, like, work is designed for that kind of context. Um, and maybe this is like the dirty commercial video games part of me, but like I can't I can't make the thing without thinking about the context and like how people are going to experience it in that kind of you know. So I'm making these things as web pages, and they're like optimized for that. Um, or like Twitter bots are like made to be on Twitter. It's not like ah, oh, here is this like exciting art, and here is like the medium or the delivery format that kind of comes later. Yeah, I don't know. And like the, the, I guess, you know, like doing the video games or doing Punch the Custard and stuff like that, like that obviously just doesn't, doesn't exist online. Like it only exists yeah. if you can put your hand in the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but like at the same time, it's like the, the same thing can kind of be adapted or like, you know, you can see that, but like a load of them are like, oh, this is interesting because you get to play around with it for a longer period of time or because you get to sit with it. Um, there's a piece that I've made, but not actually figured out how it can has kind of come out which come, spins off some of this epicycle stuff and makes this um basically uses it to make a clock that has like a different pattern and a kind of continuous animation that I guess lasts for that 24 hours um and now I'm kind of like oh I mean it, it works as a web page but actually it doesn't make sense as a web page because people are going to come and look at it and they're going to go oh that's a nice animation but like the thing you appreciate is only if it's sitting there for 24 hours if you're kind of living with it if you can like catch your eye in that kind of way and then I'm like ah damn it do I need to like make a clock and sell a physical clock that sounds like a project I don't want (laughs) or like is it a a screensaver or exactly what form is it or like how would this actually make sense to kind of show like even in an exhibition kind of context you come in you look at it and you're like oh that's kind of interesting but you only really appreciate if you're around it for a while so if you're like the invigilator in the room it would need to be like installed on the outside of 
a gallery that's interested in creative technology like mm. <laughs> and i can think of many of them and if you're listening <laughs> please get into it <laughs> um one of the other questions i had was the work that you make especially like the html pages um feel like enjoyable enough as they are but do you ever worry that you want people to understand the background like maths behind it in order to like unlock further appreciation do you want to like tell people how the magic trick is done or are you fine with them not knowing I mean I don't know sometimes I do kind of want to but I'm less interested in like you know starting a YouTube channel where like I explain stuff and like do walkthroughs and kind of deconstruction of that like less because I want to like keep the magic trick there and more just because I don't know like there's the joy is like exploring it if that makes sense like the joy is like clicking through and like feeling the texture of it and like putting some work into that like um with rgb for example like there's a whole thing of just like as you move your mouse across the screen like it's not a linear relationship between where you've got your mouse and like the relationship there it's like ah moving it halfway across moves it from like one to ten and then moving it the other half moves it from like ten to a thousand some some example like that and like tuning that curve to make it interesting to explore that is part of it um but at the same time like i guess from like the kind of nerdy point of view i do kind of enjoy putting this stuff up and where i can where it makes sense to having it just like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you can if you're like a programmer you can view the source and it's like readable and it has some of the like comments and messiness of the making process and like it would be easy to like you know minify it and compress it and like tidy that stuff away but it's kind of nice you know it's just like working with the medium right of like this kind of web page type thing it's like oh yeah it's a web page so it's like a text file you download that your browser turns into something else so mm. yeah yeah um or yeah. i did a piece for a um online magazine called taper um the display case thing that's also linked to my linked on my site and there they have a thing of like ah oh, you put your artist statement in the source code of the comments so if you want to read the artist statement you have to view source and like view the thing that people have written there i like that that's i like that that's, that's like a, a special treat for easter people egg. who yeah it is an easter egg that's it um yeah i like that you know the the tool explanation is there if you want it but actually just using it you can start to think about how it must have been made and figure out like what its capacity is as you um experience it uh so we we know each other from the internet but also work together a bit more closely over the past year because V got developing your creative practice funding which is a strand of funding from the arts council in order to yeah figure some shit out it's time and money and um some people use it for equipment some people use it to meet people some people use it to travel as well uh if anyone is interested we have like a million examples of successful funding applications to DYCP on our funding library on the white pube.com. Um, um, what... let, let me, let me just quickly shout out and say, uh, the funding library that was very helpful when I applied and that also contains my application as I was successful. So if you want to see does. the, see this conversation in funding language terms, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did you get money for? Um, again, referencing the thing that's behind you that you've still not mentioned for the people who are watching the video <laughs> version. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I got money for, um, I guess this kind of strand of work that is this kind of, I guess, generative stuff. So um, so that's kind of the, the website stuff. Um, and then it's also, I was doing a lot of stuff. I am doing a lot of stuff with a pen plotter. So like a robot that draws. So building these kind of algorithms to make make patterns um and that's kind of interesting doing pen plotter stuff because you're limited to this this sounds sounds weird to people who like primarily work by doing drawings like you're limited to just like lines you just get to draw lines on paper it's very limiting <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no i mean it, anyway it's like interesting to to break stuff down and to think in terms of like lines or movements rather than like pixels and colors and like fully rendered stuff there so um yeah it was like to develop that stuff to develop web page stuff um to buy a new pen plotter because the one i had was annoying and now i have one that's 
much less annoying to use and also bigger so I can do this kind of A3 kind of larger scale stuff. Um, and then also paying for time with you, uh, Gab. It's funny, mentorship. like, I think, like, mentorship <laughs> implies that there's some kind of, like, hierarchy between people. <laughs> you know way more about the world than I do. I haven't got a clue. Um, but I was going to ask, Zarina, did you know what a pen plotter was? I googled it and I still don't know. Okay, so maybe just, like, on a practical terms, if Zarina is, like, the litmus test for the audience... What is a pen plotter? Because it's like a tool that actually I think a lot of artists would be interested in. <laughs> um, yeah. So basically, I mean, it's it's a little it's a little friendly robot. Like it moves X Y, so it can move the arm in you know two dimensions across the surface of the paper, and there's a little motor that moves the pen up and down. Um, and you feed it you feed it basically SVGs. So it is this kind of focusing on just like here is a line, here is a movement. Um, you put a little clamp, a little pen in there, put a piece of paper under it, you set it going and then you realize, oh, actually I've calibrated it wrong and it's drawing slightly off the paper because it doesn't know <laughs> where the paper is. So it's really easy to do this. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like a little robot that you get to draw stuff, um, which is obviously interesting because you're bringing into, and especially like with the stuff I do where there's a lot of kind of random chance there, you're then bringing in obviously the random chance of the paper and the pen and how those interact and the kind of physical tactility of it. Um, but the pen plus is actually kind of amazing, like, especially if you're used to like normal printers, like it's got a resolution of, I think like about a 10th of a millimeter. So you can draw these kind of really precise things with then maybe pens that are less precise. So there's like a really weird interplay between that kind of precision and that kind of looseness. Um, yeah, it's also weird just using it like compared to drawing normally because the pen plotter doesn't like doesn't put any pressure on it. It's just like the weight of the pen or the pencil that's like holding it down. So drawing with a pencil is really difficult because you need to push harder with a pencil to like get it to make a good mark. So um, you're often kind of using like a fine liner or something like that is the kind of thing that works well. Oh, it's also kind of interesting just because it like lends itself to this kind of stuff where there's like a ton of fine detail. And so it's just like, oh yeah, yeah, a ton of very precise marks that are kind of repeated. Mm. It makes it sound like a really good um, tool for accessibility <laughs> as well, <laughs> for like energy and just like physical capabilities as well. Yeah, the difference between holding a pencil, IRL, and given a robot it instead. Yeah. Um, I guess like the, the flip side is obviously just the like, because of all of that, like you like lose a load of that like sense of liveness from it. Like is this kind of computer controlled thing? Um, mm, I don't know if, yeah, I've seen a lot of the drawings that you've generated and I don't think I agree. <laughs> I mean, like there is something important that artists have always been interested in in terms of like the visibility of their mistakes and mm. keeping like, you know, when people do draw with pencils, they often get a lot of like um, lead on the side of their hand and like then the marks might carry across on the paper and like that happens in, you know, in paintings as well. Like pay, um, artists who like use their, their like pinky finger to lean on the canvas um, and leave those marks in and that liveness can be mm. nice, but I don't know, liveliness is definitely in the works still. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I was gonna say, like, also, like, that's partly because, like, I'm, like, I guess, like, playing with it or, like, adding that in in the, like, algorithms or, like, a lot of these algorithms are based on, like, a lot of kind of random numbers or kind of simulating that kind of error. And, like, that feels like a kind of good joke to me that, like, <laughs> I've written an algorithm to simulate, like, inaccuracies or like doing something slightly wonky and then I've got like a robot to very precisely draw out that slight <laughs> wonkiness because it's like, just like so charming <laughs> yeah like it's like oh yeah yeah I put some fake wonkiness in there <laughs> and like but where you choose to put the fake wonkiness in or like where there's like weird precision or like everything's the same pressure but there's this like mimicry like that's yeah. never quite right of like these kind of human processes I don't is that know. like from a self-consciousness that you feel like you should be doing it yourself or mm, no not really like I don't mm. think I don't think I would draw this stuff myself or like 
yeah it's not it's not from a like oh i would do this by hand but i'm too lazy it's kind of instead starting from the like i guess it's starting from like actually the same same kind of thing in terms of talking about being a painter or like interested in that texture i'm like doing it because i'm interested in what those like slips in inaccuracies look like or like what is the like system behind them or like trying to like understand them in a systematic kind of way and then to understand them you try to like recreate them and then there's always the kind of joy of it not being quite right or like I don't know it just seems like a good joke to me (laughs) I I mean it it probably goes back to like what you were saying at the beginning of the conversation about like making games that you can't necessarily win like Mm. if you're making tools maybe you don't always want the tool to work perfectly like we would assume it would you make something that is is bumpy and human and see what see what you can see with it like in the same generative way yeah yeah I mean also like really I'm some of this I think is just justification for like no I think it looks nice I think it looks interesting I think like (laughs) the mark of like a lot of this kind of interesting work is like seeing like really small variations and then like in the larger form like for me that's kind of a thing I really like yeah so so it's like yeah no I want to make small variations in a repeating larger form (laughs) because I think it looks nice (laughs) artists do not say that enough oh my god i wish they did so much shit just looks good and that's it (laughs) yeah i think that should be enough as well like that that feels like so much yeah gets post-rationalized in a really strange way on podcasts and interviews and (laughs) (laughs) you've got the truth out of me eventually (laughs) um maybe we should end by talking about downpour if you wanted to Mm, do that yes um so downfall is um i guess downfall is coming out of this like kind of creative tools things that let other people make things and it's coming out of the kind of like video game stuff so it's like what if people could make video games um which obviously they can already but what if people could make video games on their phones without having to either learn to code or like deal with the fact that they can't learn to code so just a super accessible, super easy thing that you can just use, um, like built around the fact that phones have a camera in them. So you can just take pictures of things and then link those together. Like it, basically the thing it ends up as is like this hypertext thing. So it's just putting in images, putting in text, linking between pages, making that super quick and super simple to use. Um, and then, yeah, and then you can also just push the button and it uploads to the server that I got and you can then share that you can link it to people so yeah I guess that's like the first level and then the second like more ambitious thing is like once you've made this like can you then have I guess like a platform a social media platform which is people making little interactive jokes and like making these little like website nests and like ah, uh, let me link a thing together and let me like create stuff and like that kind of like handmade kind of aesthetic to stuff, um, which I think could be really nice. I'm super excited. I downloaded it. Oh, I downloaded a build of it yesterday. It's just so easy to use um, to be able to like plop little bits in. And I was just saving transparent PNGs off Google Images and just dropping them in and then looking what was in my camera roll. And it made me like look back at what I actually had and it felt like okay maybe I could use some of this like maybe it could become material for something creative or just like silly like it was really nice V messaged me yesterday to send an invitation like a a birthday party invitation but it was made on downpour and it was like again hypertext going through like um uh google maps so that i could see where your flat was and it was just getting like more and more zoomed in as i was clicking on it was just like unnecessarily (laughs) exciting for a birthday (laughs) invitation um but it did make me think like how do you feel about um are you calling it like a game making tool or is it something broader than that or do you think the word game should you know broaden itself to to meet what you're doing i think i think I mean, I think like the the, like egotistical way of kind of framing this is like, no, I'm making a new type of thing. But if you say I'm making a new type of thing, then people go, okay, well, well, what is that? (laughs) I don't want this. I don't want this new weird thing. 
Um, so yeah, no, like, but it, it does make games. It is a really good tool, I think, for making these kind of little games. And I think game is a really flexible label to put on a lot of different things, uh, especially where they've got kind of choice and interactivity and kind of exploring a space within it. Um, so I guess basically I'm saying, yeah, like it, it it's a tool for making games because games can be anything. But hopefully once people get into it, then they, I don't know, when people get into it, they might not call the things they're making games or they might use it for other purposes. Like I think, I think like a measure of success for a creative tool is whether people use it to make things that the creator didn't originally intend. Like that for me is the kind of challenge. So like cheap bots did this, like people are using it to make bots that I never would have thought of. Um, so I think similarly, I'm trying to make downpour. And this is a weird like mindfuck thing to think about because I'm like trying to make downpour in such a way that people can make things that I wouldn't think of. But I'm thinking about making it so that people would make things I can't think of, if yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and there's just like such a limit. There's a limit to that and it'll surprise you because people, <laughs> yeah, people will just run with it once once they can get their hands on it. When do you think it will be launched? Uh, I think I think this summer. Um, I mean, I I originally put up the website and it said like late 2022, and then I edited that when that came, and I was like early 2023, and now I'm looking at the website and going, oh, it's not it's not really going to come out early 2023. That's kind of happened already. <laughs> and so now, now you're I'm like put it to summer. <laughs> now you're a game designer again. I was just thinking when you were saying like a game can be anything. I was like, no, it can't. And artwork can be anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think we've got like the language for these things um but like yeah good sometimes that's good well you know you're you're the games critic and the arts critic so <laughs> you're responsible for coming up with them yeah actually that's oh. a really good point you should coin a oh, term <laughs> i'll i'll get back to you on that um okay thank you to our audience for listening to this lovely conversation uh v where can people find you on the internet if you want to be found you don't have to tell people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I basically go by V21 pretty pretty much everywhere. So my website is v21.io. My Twitter is V21. Instagram is V21, except 21 is spelled out because Instagram won't let you have a short handle. Yeah. Um, I know you went through your own tragedy about that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I got, I had at GDLP on Instagram for like two days and then it's gone. But we won't speak about that because... <laughs> <laughs> makes me sad <laughs> um thank you again for listening um and yeah we'll be back with more of these episodes chatting to interesting people because again we have lost our minds um <laughs> but hopefully it'll be worth it because there'll be a book at some point uh yeah we'll see you uh, in the next episode of the podcast bye, bye. thanks so much right. Right.